part of my philosophy on treating not just addiction, but, but mental health is this idea of doing hard things, usually some kind of physical hard thing that then touches on emotional hard places too. When we try hard things, it gives us access to working on the early traumas that might push us towards addiction. And I wanted to start this out by even saying, you know, as a mental health therapist, <clears throat> I hate my industry. I absolutely, I'm, I'm so mad at this industry. It is just completely co-opted by big pharma and bad information. Brian, how did you find Carnival? Uh, hey, Dave. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, st I'll start with kind of the, the recent finding of it and then kind of go back to my whole story around food. So the recent finding of it was, like many people, um, Sean Baker on Joe Rogan. I had been doing um, a lot of research into long-term fasting, actually, because I was just having a bunch of health issues. I was in the middle of a really bad time in my life. And um, the more I did research on fasting, the more I was like, I kind of want to check this out. I had done some previous fasts before in my life and found that they were helpful. And then once the internet came along and this idea became mainstream and I really started studying it, I was like, oh, I think I want to, I want to do that. Um, so I had heard Sean Baker on Rogan while I was kind of in the middle of this health crisis. I decided to do this long-term fast and I went out to this place called the True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California. Have you heard of it? No. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a place run by this guy named Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who's, I, I really trust him when it comes to fasting. And I don't trust him as much when it comes to diet because he is um, a vegan and the whole center is based on veganism and on, um, uh, so what do they do? They do strict vegan and then salt, oil, and sugar free. So they do get the oil and sugar free right there. Um, so I was out there and for 25 days and I did, what they do is they, they feed you in for a few days on their diet. They, they do juices for a few days. Then they do whatever the extended water fast length is that you want to do. And then they juice you out and then they feed you out. And so I, in total, I did 10 days of a water fast and it was, it was amazing. Um, it was very painful because your body starts to kind of release stored up stuff. And so these aches and pains are happening all over. And, um, but from fasting, I did notice that the, the floaties in my eyes completely left, um, inflammation that I was having, like in certain kind of organs and things was gone. I had no more pain. My digestion completely cleared up. Um, I lost, I think it was like 30 pounds. Um, yeah in like that 25 day period um, and felt great. And I was just like, oh, fasting is a superpower. Fasting is definitely one of the superpowers that you can rely on. You, you know, your body's gonna do what it needs to do and take care of itself. Um, but what's funny is <laughs> in order to get through the fast, you, you're in this like complex that has these like little apartment suites, right? And there's like, I don't know how many people are there at a time, like 50 or 75 or something. And basically you have doctors check up on you every morning, check your BP and all the, the vitals. And then you are just drinking water all day long and you can then watch these videos and go to these classes. And, and I, I had been vegan before and I'll get into that later, but I wasn't completely sold on his message and having heard Sean Baker in some of the lectures, I would raise my hand and ask the question, well, what do you think of this carnivore thing? What do you think of paleo? You know, what do you think of including meat? I don't, you think that we ate meat back in the day? And I forget what his answer was, but it just was so off the mark, like, like almost like, well, maybe we used to, but only because we had to, and it wouldn't be, you know, optimal. And, and I was just like, man, this guy's so good on water fasting and so off on this idea. Of course, I didn't say anything. I wasn't trying to cause trouble. I was just trying to have a conversation, seeing if he'd be willing to have a conversation, but actually I really liked him. And one of the things interesting things this is just a side note is i'm, I'm a mental health therapist <clears throat> and um I, i'm just a big believer that the the body and the mind 
are one and we're built healing machines. And I'll kind of get more into my theory about that later. But at the time, what I was noticing at the center was that as people take on these fasts, a lot of emotions come up because you're, you're stopping one of your addictions. You're stopping, you know, putting in food to kind of numb yourself off in these various ways. And once you stop the addiction, you know, that's when you actually have to deal with the feelings that that you've been trying to suppress. And um, so I was actually in in talks with Dr. Goldhammer about possibly coming out there and being a therapist there. And I, it was like it was an idea for a minute and then it didn't happen. But what was funny was I had discovered in order to get through the hard part of the fast, most people are like, do not read or watch anything about food. And I was the opposite. <laughs> I would turn on all the cooking shows and watch people cooking and just like that's it like kind of fed me so that I didn't have to eat. And so and I would actually take these long walks out past these restaurants and just smell the food. And like that was enough that I could power through the fast. But what I found was like it was mostly meat. I would watch people <laughs> cooking meat and I would be like, oh, my God, I want some of that so bad. So that when I finally broke the fast and began eating again, I, I came across Sean Baker again and I snuck out of the complex like after hours and <laughs> went to Whole Foods and got a roasted chicken and just crushed it. And I was like, oh, this is really good. Um, so I ended up leaving there. I, I think I tried for a while to follow the diet he recommended, but then kind of kept on coming back to the carnivore ideas. And then, you know, after a month or two, I had gained a bunch of the weight back anyway, and was just kind of going back to my old ways, which included eating some crap food and sugar and alcohol. And, um, but, but I did keep it you know, in my library that fasting is a superpower. Why, why don't I pick up there later and kind of go back to kind of early stuff around food, um, which is like, so I was born in the 70s, raised in the 70s and 80s. I think we're, we're close to the same age. And um, 74. Seven, okay, 72. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in the U.S., uh, northeast coast of the U.S., Philadelphia area, you know, I think our family had pretty standard meals, you know, you know, everything. It was like it's the time of the four food groups. So it was like meat, dairy, um, vegetables, and what was the other one? I don't even know. Um, do you remember? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. But at least meat and dairy were part of the four food groups. And so... We, you know, my, my mom wasn't a good cook. She will admit that my dad didn't do any of the cooking. Um, and she would basically just kind of do the basic standard and throw stuff on a plate. So there's almost always a piece of meat and some kind of vegetable and then some other, whatever, um, potatoes, um, once a week we'd have like a meatloaf and then once a week we'd have like pasta or um, but not bad. And I think they made a concerted effort to like not have, they didn't have junk food in the house. Whereas our neighbors, we live right next door to the Hennigans and they had, you know, I, th they were like the fe first family on the block to have like Twinkies and Doritos and Coca-Cola and just everything, Lucky Charms. And it was like, to me, that was like heaven. Like if I could ever go over there and, and sneak any of that, I would absolutely love it. Um, and what's interesting is I noticed early on an addictive pull towards sugar. Um, here in the U.S., when you went to the doctor, at least where I was from, they would have a jar of, jar of lollipops up on like the counter where the, the receptionist was. And, you know, if you were good at the end, they'd give you a lollipop. And I can remember just sitting and staring, just waiting for them to ask me <laughs> if you know, if I wanted a lollipop and just knowing the, the state that that would put me in like some kind of euphoria. Right. And then, and I had that around sugar, you know, my, my mom would make these homemade cookies and pies and, and, you know, we'd always, we'd get to lick the bowl after she kind of did the batter. And that was always a big deal and fighting over it. And, 
And then just, I just knew that if she didn't put a limit on the amount of cookies that I would just eat as many as I possibly could. Like there was no turning that switch off. I actually remember one time I was about three and a half and I went downstairs and I didn't see anyone around, but I saw a jar of honey on the counter and it was open. I'm like three and a half and I just sprint to it and I take it down and I just start guzzling it. And after a couple of seconds, I got really sick, but it, it was like whatever that escape thing was, whatever that euphoria was, I was chasing it early, early and often. Yeah. You know, and, you know, as a mental health counselor, I can tie that to several things. You know, it, w w one, I, I think just clearly now understanding nutrition, I don't think I was getting enough of what I needed nutritionally. But then there's also the, you know, the, the mini and large traumas that happen in families that kind of get locked inside you that if you don't get a chance to fully heal from those, those feelings plague you and you need to find some way to quell <laughs> that storm inside, you know? And I think food is one of the early ways of doing that. I actually think we do that to babies even. I think sometimes babies actually need to cry because it's what they need to do to release frustration. And we will shove a bottle in their mouth to get them to not cry, right? So I think from day one, we're shutting people down from their natural healing process and using often addictive substances to do it. You know, the bottle full, full of formula, which is made out of corn oil and sugar, basically, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's a huge problem. You know, that it's a huge problem that, that we're, we're starting to addict babies to nonsense junk food from a super early age without ill intent, right? We're trying our best to think about them. And yeah. um, it's actually a good name calling it formula, right? Because it literally is a formula. <laughs> it really is a formula for addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Noticing the, the predilection toward junk food and just how it made me feel. I mean, in general, I was in decent health, normal health, got sick the regular amount of times a year, whatever that is. And was very active. And I'll say throughout my life, I think my level of activity kept me healthy despite some of the dietary downfalls I had. Always playing sports, running around playing sports was like my, my main thing. It was like my main love. Oh, so yeah. So where I was going was that the, the, some of the early traumas or early things that happened in my life, which happens to all of us, right? Um, to some degree or another. Um, certainly I found relief in sugar and eating certain kinds of foods. Um, so let me see, as I got older, um, I, I do remember, I mean, only in hindsight, I can remember certain times after playing sports or while in a game, just completely and utterly crashing or bonking or having leg cramps or um, just in some way, my body just failing. And this is like, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. And in hindsight, I'm like, oh, I was at my friend's house and drank like two liters of soda before that or something like that, right? And so in hindsight, I actually have very, some very specific memories of, of that happening. I did have some uh, like innate attraction to some healthy foods. I remember if if butter was sitting out on the counter, I would go and just eat a huge chunk of it and just loved it, just absolutely loved butter. Like they would have to keep it away from me. Um, and I would also go into the refrigerator and if there was like hot dogs in there, you know, like just cold pre-cooked hot dogs, I would just like grab some and just start eating them. So, so it wasn't just all sugar. There was like some innate sense of wanting <laughs> some healthy stuff for me. Um, I also remember my mom on the holidays would make these things called rum cakes. Have you ever had a rum cake? No. So it's, it's kind of these upside down cakes that's made with, you know, sugar, flour, butter, rum. And then on the bottom, you know, she, she pours this rum mixture over that's just rum and butter and sugar and the bottom just gets drenched in it. And it was only in hindsight that she understood that she was feeding us alcohol. 
but like, you know, we started eating that at three, four, five years old and it was my favorite thing in the world and it made me feel great. And I had no idea, well, I was only, I had no idea that I was absorbing that amount of sugar, but also alcohol. Oh, and my- Double hit for the liver. Exactly, double hit for the liver and for everything else. Um, my grandfather was a recovering alcoholic. And so that gene runs in the family. And when he stopped boozing, he would just double down on sugar. And so he got this big fat belly. He was skinny everywhere else, but he got the, the big belly. It was also probably liver inflammation. Um, but I remember being over at my grandparents' house and I loved being there because they had candy hidden everywhere. And one, one day I'm eating a breakfast of like a raisin bran, just raisin bran and milk. And it's not even one of the sugar cereals, but it's still got a ton of sugar in it. And he reaches over with a spoon full of sugar. And he's like, hey there, buddy, you're going to want some of this on that. <laughs> and I was like, pop up, you're right. That's even more delicious. <laughs> so he was like showing me the way, you know. <laughs> uh, so that was a funny little story. I did, I did like meat when it was cooked right. But my mom didn't know how to cook and she thought and you, we were told you're just supposed to cook, cook it to death, right? So we would just get these bricks of chewy meat, which was not very good at all. <laughs> uh, and in middle school, so the age of like 13, 14, we start me and my group of friends in our area, we started drinking early, like I had been introduced to alcohol early, but by 13, 14, we were going out on it every weekend and looking for alcohol. So that became a major part of my life. Um, even though sports were a main thing, and I would kind of really play hard. It was like, then we would just really party hard on the weekends, any chance we could, we'd steal liquor from our parents, liquor cabinets, steal beer, you know, all that. Um, and then of course, along with that comes then eating a bunch of junk food afterwards. So that became a pattern solidified in my life. You know, you get drunk and then you eat a bunch of junk food. Um, one of my best friends at that age, he, he was also a really good athlete and he had really bad acne. And at the time it was like, well, you know, you're probably eating too much fat and you're too, it's too oily and greasy or it's a completely topical problem. So he would have all these potions and lotions and put them on. And, and then he got into the idea that it was all about not having fat in your diet. And so we had in the US, we had these two kind of um, companies that specialized in low fat, high sugar products, Little Debbie's and Snack Wells. And he would swear by them. He's like, this is what's going to do it, you know, and he would just shove his face with these sugar laden things. And uh, yeah, no, just absolute craziness. Um, and then he ended up taking this medication um, called Accutane really popular in the U S for getting rid of acne and it works, but it like wreaks hell on your organs. Um, and I remember my brother had to take that too. And just it, the side effects, if you read the side effects, it's not only like it's really negatively affecting certain organs, but like mental health wise, um, it's really bad too. So yeah, terrible that, that they had to do that. Um, at 15, I started working at a place called IHOP, the International House of Pancakes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, I was eating all that crap food. Um, and across the street, another part time job was at um, Baskin and Robbins ice cream store. And so I, you know, be scooping and then go in the back and just be eating all kinds of stuff. And, and what's crazy is I look back on it now and, you know, it's like, geez, I was just absolutely addicted in some ways to these crappy foods but no one would have said that or guessed it it's not like i was doing it in at least as, I, as far as i can tell any more or less than anyone else around me you know but probably more but like since i was an athlete and i and i was trim no one thought anything about it i didn't think anything about it um and then i took a trip out to tucson arizona to visit my sister who was going to the u of a and she was always this kind of radical free thinker. And she kind of introduced me to like thinking differently about things. And when I visited her out there, she was living in a vegetarian vegan community of kind of hippies that were against the system. And, and I was like, this is kind of cool. 
you know, like they, they had some really good ideas. They had some really bad ones too, but they actually had some really good ideas outside the system and they could like think independently about how things should be done, you know, how to reorganize society and culture. And they had their own little like communes and, and, and it really at 15, it just opened my eyes. So it, it's amazing how things seem to change, you know, like vegans being against the system. Uh, for me now, it feels like vegans are the system, you know? hundred percent, hundred percent. But that was like the early nine, late eighties, early nineties. And where vegans were like, definitely completely outside the system and were total weirdos. And, you know, th there was some books written. There was this book, um, diet for a small planet francis moore la pay and then the guy john robbins who was actually from the baskin robbins family that i worked at the ice cream store <laughs> he got outside the system was writing stuff about vegetarianism too and and i read those books at 15 and was like these are people trying to think about health and the health of the planet and i trust them because there's no one else around me that's trying to think about those things you know, in some ways, my parents were just very traditional, hardworking, traditional people, but not questioning the system, really. And no one around me was that. So like, when I found people that were actually questioning the way things were done, I was like, oh, they might be my people. I forgot to mention that I was in trouble a lot as a kid. I had a ton of energy. If I had been born a generation later, they would have put me on ADHD medication and um, just all that nonsense when I really just needed to run around a lot, you know. But because I was in trouble a lot, it made me be able to learn how to navigate inside and outside the system. But it made me into kind of like a free thinker where I just didn't buy everything that was given to me. Um, so when I came back from visiting my sister in Tucson, I was I was a vegetarian for three years. That's from 15 to 18, um, which is a weird time to do it at that age and especially at you know in the in the 90s and people thought i was weird and i was like i don't care i'm just gonna i'm gonna do it but i was also still an athlete but in hindsight i noticed that my athletic performance went way downhill way downhill not only physically but mentally everything got weaker and and i entered school a better soccer player than i left school in um, and then I, when I ended up going to college, I did play for a year. I was still good enough to be able to do that, but I, I just couldn't handle it just emotionally and physically. There was just, I just wasn't what I used to be. And I had no idea it was linked to diet. I was getting arrested. I was getting kicked out of schools. I went to three different high schools. I was in all kinds of trouble. I was trying to steal cars and run away. I did steal a bunch of money and ran away to Florida. I was, I was just getting in a lot of trouble. Um, I got thrown in front of a bunch of different psychologists until I landed in front of this one guy who actually really knew how to listen and helped me through a lot and actually sent me away to rehab when I was 18. So see, he challenged me to not drink and I couldn't do it. Um, and then he, I went away to rehab <clears throat> and that kind of changed my life around. And so for, for three very strict years, I went to AA and just kind of lived by that. Um, and it was during that time that had a lot of just emotional growth, still thinking outside the system and now being so thoroughly different from my peers, being sober at 18. Um, I just really started to think about things differently. And, and I was applying the idea of addiction to everything, right? That like where in my life in mind and body am i trying to escape the present in order to make myself feel better and so then i started to really apply that to food as well and started to do even more like research and kind of went into veganism and macrobiotics and whatever the next book was that i could find it was like the next answer you know um and i discovered some interesting things there about kind of when, when you can kind of clean your body out from the crap things work better um, even if it's a raw vegan diet, it's better than the crap, you know? Um, and <clears throat> I, uh, went away to college for a semester, dropped out. I didn't like it. And I, I ended up knocking on my psychologist's door and saying, whatever I was doing with you was way more interesting than school. Teach me everything you knew, you know? So he actually took me under his wing 
and he taught me kind of his therapeutic practice. He literally sat down with me once a week and would listen to me for 45 minutes and then we would switch roles and he would teach me how to be his therapist. Um, and then he brought me into a class of other adult professionals learning the same process. And so I practiced with him and with them once a week for 33 years. I still do it to this day with him. Yeah. So he's still my mentor. So everything I know about therapy, even though I went to school for it, I really learned in practice, which also makes me not, not anti-education, but like just very skeptical of, you know, book learning versus doing, um, which is one of the reasons I love the carnivore community. It's just people trying shit, you know, just people trying it out and then telling their story. And to me, that's the best science in the world. Um, so anyway, I, um, one of the reasons I ended up leaving AA and practicing this other thing more was because I would see, you know, no offense, but like these obese people in AA drinking coffee every five minutes and smoking cigarettes and then being so proud that they weren't drinking alcohol. And I was like, buddy, you might as well just go and drink. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm sure your life's a little bit better, but like you're not looking too good there. Right. So I was like, one of the sayings in AA was like, you, you come here because you want what other people have. And after three years, I stopped wanting what other people had, right? Because it didn't look so healthy to me. So I kind of went my own route. I will say then from my early 20s through my 30s, it was an interesting mix of so me practicing this therapeutic process with my mentor and other people. And that was like the mainstay of my life. That was the thing I cared most about. So in order to kind of support that, I had a bunch of different jobs in the world um, just to kind of learn about the world and to meet people and see how this psychology applied to other people in the world. Um, and so I was a, I was a camp counselor, a soccer coach, a, a landscaper, a handyman's assistant. I worked on a farm. I was a bike courier. I worked in a mortgage company. I was a video store clerk I, I, and 40 other things, right? Just like it was a really interesting period of time. And I eventually decided to go back to school and to major in social work and counseling and to get my degrees there so I could apply what I had learned from my mentor. Um, and all throughout that time, I would ebb and flow through kind of trying to figure diet out and what I wanted to eat and how to get in shape. Um, pl still playing sports a lot and then go through periods of just like, ah, I just want to be like everyone else and I'm just going to eat whatever's at the corner deli and, you know, go out drinking with buddies. And, and so it was just this constant like back and forth with that. Um, I, uh, I got my degrees and, um, then worked in the social work and counseling field for a while, running a violence prevention organization in Philadelphia. I taught as an adjunct professor of social work at Temple University and ran some um, team building trainings um, and really started, I was working so much, I started to kind of get out of shape. And, and finally in my thirties was like, oh, I can gain weight in my gut. I had never been able to gain weight before. And I was like, oh, here it is. Um, so I was like, I gotta do something about this. I ended up leaving that profession um, and did a 180 and was like, I think I want to be an actor. And so I just took a couple acting classes. And before I knew it, I was a regular company member at this theater for three years and doing plays and working part time <clears throat> outside of the theater to support that. And I got married at the time, too. And throughout that time of being an actor, um, my wife and I were also experimenting with diet. We had seen the documentary fat, sick, and nearly dead. And we tried juicing and we tried veganism and we, you know, the roads I had already been down, but that now other people were discovering. So I kind of went back to, and I was like, let me try this again. And you know, a juice fast works in some ways it works because you're ridding your body of a bunch of crap and you, you, your digested tract has a chance to rest a little bit and like, you know, and when it works to that extent, you start to think, well, maybe you need to do more of this or, you know, some form of this more um, smoothie fasts. And um, 
And then we eventually found somehow the uh, Whole30 diet. And um, we tried that. And I was like, okay, this seems to make more sense. And this worked. And it worked for her. We both felt a little bit better. Um, and and uh, who even knows what happened next? It's like life is such a blur. But I think um, it was difficult being an actor. I eventually became a full-time actor. And it's all I was doing to support myself while I was married. Um, but it took a huge toll on the relationship and on my health because it's a lot of late nights and, you know, eating food on set and just not really being able to take care of myself in the way that I would, would want to. Um, and our marriage only lasted 10 years and that kind of coincided with the tail end of my, my acting career. Um, <clears throat> and, but it was pick back up at that time when I was still married and starting to research fasting. And then I ended up at true North health center and then came back. Um, but then the next couple of years was still kind of back and forth with, with stuff. But, but in 2018, I really started to research carnivore and, and a, a handful of times tried it for, you know, two, three weeks, maybe a month. Then I'd go back and forget about it and kind of just join normal life again and then kind of come back to it. And I did notice that each time I did it, like I felt good. I felt really good. Um, during the pandemic, I was living with a new girlfriend in a different apartment and um, she was gluten-free and kind of very athletic and she agreed to try carnivore with me. So I think we I think we tried carnivore and stuck to it for maybe like 45 days or something like that. And, but at the end, tail end started to include alcohol, which then was a downward spiral into just eating whatever we wanted, but, you know, trending towards healthy, but whatever we wanted, you know, um, I will say that since the discovery of carnivore and trying it, my health did, or my eating habits did trend towards more healthy than less healthy. Um, something about just the inclusion of that meat made me remember that that just makes me feel best most of the time. So even if I included other junk food, I would always go back to that as a baseline. Um, but I, I don't think I had ever done it strictly for more than 45 days. Um, but I did some version of it for, for a while. Um, <clears throat> then let me see. Um, I think it was just, so right at the end of the pandemic, you know, when we were kind of being released from our cages, I decided to go down to, uh, yeah, I'll tell you this too, David. I don't know. You can edit this out if you need to. Of all the mistakes I've made in my life, one of the biggest was getting the jab that I will, I will always regret that because I knew, I knew that it wasn't the right thing for me to do. And yet there was some, you know, my fr best friend's a doctor and all these doctors are saying, get it, get it, it's fine, get it, it's fine. And at the end of the pandemic, I was questioning whether or not I wanted to be an actor and I got accepted into this acting program in Louisiana. You know, it was gonna be eight people and it was gonna be amazing. We were gonna be in a black box and sweating and crying and working hard. And I would leave with a, the degree and then, then I could teach acting if I wanted to at university. But more importantly, I wanted to just get better and continue at it. Turns out I didn't like the program at all. Um, so I left after four months, but they made me get vaccinated in order to be there. So, and I was like, okay, whatever. Everyone's saying it's fine. And then in hindsight, I'm like, oh, I didn't wanna do that, you know? Um, anyway, I ended up coming back from that and landing in this town, uh, that I'm in now media and working at this great place called the Phoenix center for experiential trauma therapy, where I'm a mental health therapist. And so I've been doing this full time now for three years. Um, and I think it's when I landed back here that I just a, a new life, a new decision. I just decided to kind of dive deep into having meat be the living a meat-based life 
um, and having periods where I, I dove in more deeply and doing it more strictly and then would add stuff back in and then always kind of come back to it. <clears throat> and that's really still what I'm doing. Um, and I just recently tried it again and, and strictly for, I think, five or six weeks. Um, I always feel great. I always shed my body fat, but I do have real difficulty in the strict transition to ketosis. And I do find that I really struggle with sleep and with kind of energy dips. There's some way that certain times of the day, I'll, I will have that smooth kind of keto energy. And then I'll just like crash and not have any energy and just need to sleep. And it's just like, okay, I just need to work through this. But then it felt like I'm not working through this, you know, and then and then sleep would be really hard and you, the heart is racing and people are like, well, maybe it's electrolytes. Well, it wasn't that. And I tried almost everything. Um, and then if I would add back carbs in a little bit, then I could sleep. And I've heard that more than once. So I don't know if that's a thing and I and, and it actually what I need or if I just needed to kind of like push through to get to the other side of something and maybe up my fats, maybe up my electrolytes even more. I'm not sure. I'm willing to keep testing that out to see if I can actually break through that. But for the time being, I'm 97% carnivore. And then at night, I'll have some honey. And that seems to help me sleep. So uh, like what, what are the main things that kind of keep you on this path is it is it maintaining the stable weight or is it like related to mood or yeah it's 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 everything it's everything and and that's kind of the most important question because <clears throat> it, it it all kind of ties in and let me see if i can try to say this as as eloquently as possible but Yes. Number one is just the physical feeling of lightness and less inflammation and easy digestion and just feeling like something is working here. This machine, this engine is running correctly, right? Um, I have more energy in workouts. I just, I just feel smoother energy throughout the day and an extreme mental clarity that I don't have when I'm on carbs. Um, an ability to to be, I, I'm more grounded. I can kind of resist the impulsivity of whatever little emotional things are happening, right? They kind of want to pull you in sometimes. Um, as a therapist, I noticed just sitting with people and listening to them, I, I kind of have more attention and I have a little bit more insight. I'm just a little bit more calm, um, but quick uh, at the same time. <coughs> Um, I love the carnivore community in that it's a community of free thinkers who are just trying to figure stuff out and sharing with each other. And it's, it, it pokes through the pseudo reality created around us of this kind of captured economy, you know? captured by big ag and big pharma and big oil and the military industrial complex and the whole thing, you know, that this group of people who are trying to figure this piece out and just doing it completely based on honesty and experience are, are uncovering a piece of reality that's, that's very real. And that, as I said, it pokes through the pseudo reality all around us. And so when I'm a part of that community and I listen to your podcast and other podcasts where people are talking about this, I feel, I feel a sense of ease and connection and groundedness because we're talking about very real things and we're not dabbling in bullshit, right? We're not peddling bullshit. Um, I, I have, um, suggested this to several friends and they've tried it and with to great success and they love it. And they, it's kind of their baseline. They'll go back to it when they can. Um, I've tried it with several clients, um, and they love it. Um, if, and when they can stick to it, the question with them is like, when do I try to introduce it to them? Is it like after we've done some psychological work first, or do I try to do it early on? And I'm still trying to figure that out. 
Um, I will say that. Well, yeah. Yeah. That, sorry to interrupt. That was going to be one of my questions. Like, you, I'm just guessing as not someone with any background in in mental health um, at all, but when you're sitting there and you're listening to people, you must at times be thinking there's work that there's therapy that we need to do we, we've got work we need to do but this is surely going to be helped by nutrition no 100 percent, dave it's it's hard for me to not have it be the first things out of my mouth you know which is why i i, I mean I, I had written to you i actually want to start my own youtube channel that's based on a combination of eating meat and doing hard things and then my particular psychological approach so i want to encapsulate it all in one because i think it, it is all completely connected and related um so yeah it's tough it's i i honestly believe that if we took care of diet exercise sleep and physical affection that we would account for 80 percent of all what we call mental health issues and then there's there's more that I would even add to that list, you know, that and then the actual quote unquote trauma that needs to be healed. There's there's a way to do that. And it's very important to do that. But if you had those other pillars in place, your experience of whatever is bothering you inside wouldn't be nearly as harsh or as extreme. And I wanted to start this out by even saying, you know, as a mental health therapist, <clears throat> I hate my industry. I absolutely, I'm, I'm so mad at this industry. It is just completely co-opted by big pharma and bad information and diagnoses and medications, which 99.9% .9 of the time I think are total bullshit. I, 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 the first thing I tell any of my new clients that come in here, I say, there's nothing wrong with your brain. It's not broken. You don't have a thing that they told you you had. You might be undernourished, you not, might be under exercised, you might not be getting enough sleep, you might have relationship issues, and yes, you might have experienced some big traumas and a thousand little traumas that we need to help you heal from, but you are not broken and you don't have a diagnosis, and I'm, I will never give you a diagnosis. And when they make me, because they're trying to get uh insurance reimbursement i always put ptsd just post-traumatic traumatic stress disorder because we all have some form of that right um, but i refuse i refuse to take part in what i think is total nonsense because in the when i studied under my mentor and was part of a community of people that exchanged time listening to each other and helping each other heal over the course of 33 years i have literally listened to thousands of people and I've been listened to thousands of times and I've never seen somebody that has some innate biological permanent broken brain or chemical imbalance that they can't heal from if they do the right things. Um, and then I have people that have never done extensive practice, but have, you know, three PhDs because they've gone to school and written some papers and taken some tests. And they're the ones prescribing medication. And but my very first client, my very first client, a young single mother of two had just tried to commit suicide for the third time and had been institutionalized a couple of times. Came to me and I just said, well, hey, tell me your story. She told me her story for 45 minutes, severe history of abuse and all kinds of other things. At the end of the time, she said to me, wow, no one's ever asked me that before. And I said, what the f Sorry, <laughs> did the psychiatrist do? Well, they asked me my symptoms and then they gave me medication. And Dave, it just, it makes me wanna burn the whole thing down. You know, it's so broken. Like it's not even close to what it should be. And so anyway, yeah, I-, I, I it it's awful when you think about it when she walks in the door of a psychiatrist's office and the psychiatrist is just looking at her like well how am i going to get the money out of her yeah yeah and 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 what's what's even worse than that is is the people that actually believe in what they're doing 
the, the people that have studied because they've been told to study these med medication reactions and told that this fixes a supposed chemical imbalance and 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 believe it like that's even sadder than the one who's just out for money you know so yeah i i i have these conversations with the guy that runs this place who's a great guy and he's really good at what he does and I, I try to talk about nutrition as a key pillar to what we do. And, and he says behind closed doors, I don't disagree with you, but we have to be careful about how we say that for all kinds of reasons, right? Including that's supposedly not our job. And, you know, it can be very triggering with people with eating disorders and all kinds of stuff, even though we know the amount of stories of people curing eating disorders with carnivore, right? And keto and um, so I, I love I love the work that that uh, Georgia Ede and Amber O'Hearn and Brett Schur and Chris Palmer are doing, and they're really tying it up and sh proving now that these so-called mental health disorders can be cured with diet alone, at least in some of the cases. Um, that's crazy to me. How if if you do introduce this to someone in in the setting where they've come to you and they they're they're sharing their background and you kind of think, well, nutrition might help. What kind of reaction are you getting? <laughs> yeah. All kinds of reactions. And, and it, I, I need to keep getting better and better at like sussing out how and when to bring this up with people. Right. And, and with each person, I need to say it slightly differently or in a slightly different way. Right now I have a vegan, um, and, you know, I'm just trying to tiptoe around it, you know, to try to get there. Um, I've had a few people that have jumped right in. Um, actually, my the client that I've been seeing the longest here for three years, I still see him every week. And he still tells me, I love therapy with you. I've grown a ton. I love everything we do. But the meat based diet is the single thing that changed my life the most. And it's like, holy shit, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and I have a couple other clients with kind of similar, similar stories. There. A couple of people tried it, loved it, but then I think they forgot that they loved it, you know, and you get back onto the conveyor belt of just being normal and eating that crap. And then it's just hard to go back. And, you know, um, I, I'm, yeah. My, my, my feeling about this kind of thing is just from my own experience yeah. is you you get so conditioned over your life to feeling like well the only answer to everything is a drug yes so that um i i feel like had i never heard about this had i never experienced keto in the past and i go to a doctor or i go to a therapist and they would say to me you know you could just change your diet and this would probably clear up. Uh, I would be like, mm, this makes no sense. Yeah. What kind of, what kind of woo woo doctor or woo woo therapist are you? Exactly. Exactly. And I, I get that. And I, I try to laugh with my clients about, it. I try to, I try to be as normal of a guy as I can. I, I don't consider myself like some, guru expert above them, I, I say, look, I'm probably just as, as you are. So let's just talk. Let's figure this out. Right. Um, but yeah, when, when I say it, I, I think it also immediately feels I think what happens to people is it a they've heard it a million times that they, they've they've heard throughout their lives growing up you should be eating this and you shouldn't be eating this and you should be exercising more, right? So they already feel just like the weight of all those expectations that they've never lived up to anyway, right? Or if they've tried to, they've failed and they feel bad about themselves. So like for anyone to suggest anything in that realm, I think it's already kind of triggering territory for people, right? Um, and so I, I, I'm i trying to figure out how to do it as best I can. Um, and and I'm, I'm actually playing with, being a little bit more adamant about it and saying, I mean, I, I give the whole ancestral speech, you know, I, I say, Hey, let, you want to talk about your mental health? Let's talk about it. First of all, for hundreds of thousands of years, we were not living in these boxes. 
you know, we were outside, we were moving around for several hours a day, we were getting sunlight, we were in the elements, we were in nature, we were drinking pure water, we were hunting and eating meat as much as we could, you know, and just that alone, you not doing that is a mental health crisis. Um, so I try to paint that picture for people and some people can kind of take that in and some people, you know, it just blows right past them. But just when you when you say that you know it i always draw parallels to the animal kingdom and you know like as we've advanced <laughs> advanced and you know we've we've got into these boxes and the blue screens and and all the, the blue light and all this kind of thing you know our mental health progressively gets worse, right? Yeah. But you never, there, there's never a hippopotamus like <laughs> asleep and like when they open their eyes, they're like, I can't face today. <laughs> you know, I, they, they just get up and they, they get on with whatever they've got to do. They eat and they crap and they do whatever they got to do, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that <laughs> to have people be putting their pets, on antidepressants it's like you didn't take That's your a thing oh you didn't even have heard of that no. oh my god Dave people are putting their pets on all kinds of shit you know well he's anxious he misses me all day and he's anxious I was like well have you taken him for a walk today has he gotten the actual exercise he needs are you feeding him a carnivore diet or are you feeding him like wheat and corn you know what I mean like <laughs> yeah Yep, antidepressants for pets. That should be criminal. It's nuts, right? It's not. But, but I, I guess, yeah. I mean, so the the farmer reps will be going around the the veterinary surgeries and selling the. Oh, that this is terrible. It's nuts, and I don't know over you know where you were raised or where you are now in Japan the the extent to which they're medicating children. But here, medication of children starts very young, three, four, five years old. If you're not sitting still, if you exhibit any symptoms of sadness or of this or of that, they figure out a diagnosis and they're, they're giving you meds. I mean, the, when, when I have teenagers come in here in my office, um, a lot of them are, are on two, three, four meds already, already. And they think that's just the way you do it. And when I suggest otherwise, they think I'm nuts. And when I suggest to their parents otherwise, they think I'm nuts. It's terrible. And they're already, I mean, they're already medicated with their their smartphone and their this and everything that's going on throughout the day. And then it's like, no, you're still too noisy. Take these. You're still too active. Take these drugs too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, it's so sad. When I, I, it reminds me when I was in, four years old, I was in nursery school and I wasn't ready to take naps with the rest of the kids. I was just like, yeah, I'm not tired. I'm not laying here. And I, luckily I went to this kind of alternative school where instead of just like bashing me, um, which they would have done in other schools, they actually figured out to let me go play soccer with the first graders. And I still remember that as like a real growth experience and a trusting in what I needed. I didn't need a nap. I needed to go out and run, you know, and I just so thoroughly trust people's bodies. I trust people's physiologies to figure it out given the right circumstances. But the more we're shutting ourselves down with whatever the medications and the crappy foods and the screens and the addictions, our physiologies don't have a chance to heal. And, and I, I believe that we're born healers and we can heal given the opportunity. And I think carnivore is a, is a huge piece of that. Yeah. So in based on your experience with the people that you see day to day and, and what's happening <laughs> with animals on antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs and stuff, um, where do you think this is going? Like, where where might we be twenty years from now? <clears throat> so, some people are starting to sound the alarm. Like Casey and Kaylee Means are talking about. Just literally, just to bring them up. Yeah, 
Mm. Yeah, you know, I had this really <laughs> fortuitous and lucky experience that I had been doing this online project um, a year ago where I was publicly challenging myself to do a boxing match and to process my fears about it publicly to show people that you can do a hard thing that you're scared of and still do the thing. Um, and it's necessary to, to, to do it and process it. Um, the project itself was a failure for several reasons, but that's not the point. The point is that during it, I was kind of discovered by the, um, the RFK junior campaign and they flew me out to LA to sit down with him and just talk with him for an hour about mental health and addiction and, and what we can do. And there's a, a documentary, um, called, um, recovering America that there's just little slivers of me in there, but, but I bring him up because he's now in tight with Callie and Casey means and, and that whole group of people that's trying to figure out, you know, how to make America healthy again, which I think is incredible. Yeah. So where is this going? That was your question. Where is this going? Um, I think that is a movement. I think that crew of people there and you know who that crew of people includes, right? It's, it's, it's RFK and it's the means and it's, um, Jordan Peterson and, and Mikhail, it's Russell Brand, it's, and it's, it's a lot of carnivores, a lot of, you know, the thinkers in this community are kind of with that crew of people. And it's people thinking outside the box, trying to figure out what's right. So if we don't get blown up, and if they don't come and off all of us that are trying to think through these things and challenge the system, um, hey, we got a shot at making things a lot better if we can stick together and, and look for the truth. Yeah, well, uh, here's hoping because, yeah, it, it it does feel like things are spreading. It does feel like there's a bit of momentum, but, you know, it's it's still a very David versus Goliath thing, right? It is. Well, so, you know, Dave, the reason I did this now, I, I wrote this to you. I had been wanting to start my own channel for a while. And my life just is busy and things are taken over and then I get scared of doing it and I don't want to be out there doing a public facing thing again. But you released that video, I think it was just two weeks ago, where you said, hey, it doesn't matter what your story is. Just come and talk to me. If, if you've had any little bit of success on this thing, come talk to me because we're helping other people get healthier lives. And I was like, OK, I got to I got to talk to Dave and hopefully I can help one or two people. That would be useful. Well, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, but so, Brian, how can people reach out to you? Um, do you do you have a YouTube channel name re reserved yet, or anything like that? I I do have a name. I'm I'm gonna um, not give it to you until I I figure out if I I don't know if I need to trademark it. I don't know how to do all these things. Um, but I do have a name that I'll, I'll share with you. I'll, I'll email you and, and maybe I can even ask for your advice on something. But um, but if people want to reach out to me, I'd love to have discussions with anybody. Um, you can just email me at my old email address, which is Brian Gallagher actor at gmail dot com. No worries. Well, um, yeah, I'm happy to happy to chat about uh, about the name or anything like that. But yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll uh, link to your email in the show notes. Huh. Brian, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. I really appreciate your time. Dave, you are so welcome and thank you. I think the work you're doing is absolutely tremendous and selfless and fun. And uh, just please keep doing what you're doing.